Before I begin this video, I wanted to quickly mention that my merchandise has been released. Yes, I know there's been a significant lack of advertising in a main channel video owing to some external reasons, but at least I'm back to let you know that you can buy a hoodie and a limited edition poster. More information about that as well as some extra details on my whereabouts will be left at the end of the video. Now on to your regularly scheduled feature presentation. Video games are fun. They offer something that movies and podcasts and books and ebooks and vbooks aren't able to provide, which is allowing you to immerse yourself in an environment that you have complete control in most of the time. It's becoming a little cliche to constantly bring that point up about video games every single time we make a video about them, but the point is always the same. As opposed to movies and books where no matter how many gimmicks they put in to try and immerse you in the product, there's still a divide between the real world and the world that's projected onto your two double-decker bus height screen, video games have that link that flows from the HDMI cable from the screen to your console of choice, then from a port on that console all the way into your controller where you are the master of the universe that's been shoved in front of you. The entire point of a game obviously is for the person to play it and the decisions that are made in the process would influence the rest of the game, even if it's a simple endless runner or a game of Minesweeper. Some films are starting to use this concept to influence the way they go about making their products such as Netflix's Black Mirror episode. Bandersnatch. You'll notice this all over social media. Choose your own adventure films flooding your feed when they're made once in a blue moon, with the intention of these films being to give the control of the narrative to the player and making them choose where to go from their position. Sometimes this is cool and good and innovative, but once the novelty wears off, it becomes very, very tedious. People want to sit back and watch a film, not be alert throughout the whole thing and miss an on screen QTE because they left the room to go and check on a Discord ping and now the film character is dead and the credits are all. Choose your adventure products like Bandersnatch have a major plotline about them that's very relevant to this video, and I'll leave you guys to guess what it is. It's to do with a video game! It all loops back to the fact that the product in question is a game itself. And what better genre to showcase this than with the horror genre? And no, this isn't an excuse for me to talk about horror games again for 20 minutes, I swear! When you watch horror films, all you can really do is witness the carnage as the main character does an unbelievably stupid decision before your very eyes. Where are you going? It's not like they can hear you screeching bloody murder through the screen. They've already been pre-programmed by the director to do what they're told to do, and what they're told to do is be stupid. With a horror game on the other hand, you are now the brainlet as you make the really stupid decision to look in that really dark corridor without a flashlight and walk right into a dimension of nothingness to be greeted with two white dots and teeth. Throughout the years, game developers have utilized a new way to involve players in their twisted little games by making game protagonists aware that they're in a game or making them aware that their actions are not their own. Or Maybe making the game itself interact with you, not the character you're playing as or even the game window. You. This phenomenon is known in simple terms as breaking the fourth wall. The fourth wall is a performance convention in which an invisible wall separates the characters in the world from the audience viewing it. This expression comes from the world of theatre. It's a one-sided wall in which the audience can see what's going on within these walls, but the characters on the stage cannot. Think of it as a literal box with the audience on one side. There are three actual real walls on all other sides of the box and there's one invisible wall that the audience can see through, but the actors in the scene cannot. In most cases, the characters stay within these walls, but there are some cases in which the characters will break these characters mostly rebel against the oppressing regime of the wall in order to interact with the audience maybe once or twice or throughout the rest of the production. From what I've said already, you've probably noticed that this indeed mostly happens in theatre, but I'm going to narrow the examples all the way down to just video games and maybe some television programs as well. Because of the nature of the genre, in video games the fourth wall is constantly broken by having the game ask the player for their own input, which could be loads of buttons in a second, or in the case of some games, staring at the screen until a prompt shows up to press a single button. Penned by Stephen Conway in 2009, it's been said that most games don't really break the fourth wall. Instead of a box that the player isn't a part of, it's a circle completely surrounding the player. This circle immerses the player in the world of the game and asks for their input into said world as opposed to keeping the player out and completely separated from the in-game environment. This is the case with most games, but some games take this concept and run with it very, very far away. And in this video, we'll cover a specific type of fourth wall breaking that slowly risen in popularity over the past few years. But first, we must go back to the beginning.
The year is 2002. The Spider-Man film was released to the public and planted the seeds for the massive tree that is comic book movies. Halo Combat Evolved was released and planted the seeds for the slightly smaller but still chugging along tree that is slow paced FPS games. And two Grand Theft Auto games were released, a notion that is pure fiction nowadays. A small development studio called Silicon Knights banded together and created a psychological horror game that would take the market by storm in a highly competitive year of franchise starters that also included Kingdom Hearts and Metroid Prime among other games. Eternal Darkness was released on June the 24th 2002 for the GameCube and it was published by Nintendo. Yes, Nintendo published adult-oriented video games, would you believe it? Eternal Darkness was originally made with the intention of being released on the Nintendo 64 system, but during the development of the game, the developers changed their minds and switched to the GameCube for the graphics. As for the story, the game's plot was inspired by the works of Alfred Hitchcock, Stephen King, Edgar Allan Poe, and H.P. Lovecraft. Now, what do these authors have in common? The obvious answer will be that they're all dead, but the real answer is that they all made stories that focused on psychological horror, aka mind screwing with text. In the game, you play as Alex Roivas, a student at Washington Uni, and you're headed to your family estate in the very expensive, nice, pleasant, peaceful area that is Rhode Island, only to find that your grandfather has been murdered. What makes things even better is that there's no sign of any outside interference. So an admin must have really hated him that day, or he committed several acts of RDM and got punished for it. Because of the lack of evidence, the police investigation stops, and in theory, you should probably stop investigating too. But of course you don't, you're a strong, independent university student, and this is the best chance to take a gap year from your studies and escape from that hellhole. While investigating, you come across a book called THE TOME OF ETERNAL DARKNESS! <laughs> Roll credits. Basically the Book of Shadows from Corpse Party but on steroids and LSD and cocaine. SD. After being in possession of said book, she gains the knowledge of all the people described in the book, a visualization of what teachers think exam revision is like, if you will. She also gains magical powers from the book, which is cool and whatever, I guess. It comes at a cost, however, and the penalty is that her grip on reality and sanity suffers as a result. But this won't stop her. She's gonna put an end to the book once and for all, so no one can ever be hurt by it again. You can't burn it though because magical reasons are some bull. Upon release of the game, people were very quick to point out that the mechanics in said game were very similar to a title released earlier, Resident Evil. Oh we gods! Plagiarism has befallen Nintendo! Objection! While it did feature Resident Evil-like mechanics, the game had its very own unique twist that links back to the magic circle. The game possessed a sanity meter, a mechanic that's used more frequently nowadays because of games like Amnesia The Dark Descent. If your character came across something freaky or saw a monster or something, the sanity meter provided would shrink a tiny bit. And the only way it could be raised is by performing finishing moves on opponents. Trust me, this makes more sense when you're actually playing the game. Now, if you're really bad at video games or you just wanted to get the effects for views on YouTube, you would start getting hallucinations in-game from the sanity meter lowering. If you let it get to the bottom where you're almost completely insane, the game starts to not only mess with your character, but mess with you directly as a punishment for being a bad gamer. As such, the game would of course provide plenty of nightmare fuel for an innocent child who snuck downstairs to play the game at 2am in the morning on a school night. Examples of the game's tomfoolery include having your character walk into a new room and all of a sudden your inventory is cleared. And there's tons of monsters in the room. And your GameCube controller's unplugged itself. Hey, yo, whoa, 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 whoa. Ah! In other cases, after taking a lot of damage, you probably want to heal yourself with your strongest potions. So you cast a healing spell only to- Oh. Oh dear. Some hallucinations actively mess with your playing experience, with the game sometimes faking a complete shutdown only to reopen your game and delete your save data. Gotcha! Your files are safe. The game takes things one step further by sometimes playing as normal, then it will cut to Alex reading the Tome of Eternal Darkness! Bruh. Wait, what? What the fuck? I spent 60 great British pounds on this game, what do you mean it's a demo? There are many more ways that the game actively chooses to directly mess with you by smashing through the fourth wall as a way for you as the player to get good. You're pretty much no longer safe in the comfort of your own home while you're gaming. Watch to stop the GameCube from gaining a mind of its own and deleting all of your saves because you're up way past your bedtime, you naughty boy! Eternal Darkness was released to acclaim across the entire board. Everyone loved the game and called it a massive achievement in game development, with the game being rated as one of the greatest of all time. Nintendo took all of this praise on board and cancelled the sequel.
and the studio Ooh. went bankrupt. Despite this, it did show that there was a market for meta horror and games that derived the horror from directly messing with the player. And this trend would continue through the 2000s. Breaking the fourth wall like Eternal Darkness did was still a moderately rare art throughout the early 2000s, but some games still went through with it and did it well. One of the biggest examples of this is in Metal Gear Solid, and of course it's... Psycho Mantis. Psycho Mantis needs no introduction, but one of his many abilities is the ability to read minds. In Metal Gear Solid, he demonstrates this in a creepy fashion to the player by reaching through the fourth wall and tearing it apart. In the cutscene, he flexes his powers by starting to read your memory card in order to weird you out into thinking he knows exactly what you've been doing on that PlayStation of yours. Yes, he definitely knows all about your low poly porn you've been storing on that one megabyte memory card. As a child, that would understandably freak you the fuck out. Nowadays though, people who know about the mechanics would have a hearty laugh at making Psycho Mantis spell out an inappropriate name, as he reads your memory card mind and spells out your renamed bootleg copy of Conker's Bad Fur Day totally legit. Metal Gear Solid is a very good example of meta horror done effectively for one big reason. It's not developed and marketed as a horror game. Sure there may be some moments that make your insides go for some brown action, but it doesn't set out to cause accidents in people's nappies you cry babies. The actions of Psycho Mantis would freak the player out and make them start to question the link between reality and fiction. And this started a trend of games that aren't even horror games taking turns to beat the crap out of the fourth wall and freak out the player. For example, in the original Animal Crossing game, you're constantly lectured to save your game when you're finished with your session like any sane person would do. Failure to do so would lead to retribution. If you do this multiple times, Resetti would get fed up of your shenanigans and reset all of your progress in the game. Just kidding! Save your game, you don't! Batman! Arkham Asylum, you play as the man of many bats as you try to escape the area that you've been trapped in. One of the rogues that you have to beat up is Scarecrow, but before you can do that, you may end up getting injected with the fear toxin. The only warning that you get that it's about to happen is a single cough that you probably would pass off as a random character interaction. But when the fear toxin finally hits, it does a variety of things to mess with Boom. you, like displaying the wrong names for areas you've visited, for example. The game might also take things even further and fully crash your game all the way back to the start, wiping your save. Just kidding, your save is intact. You're just playing as the Joker now, baby! On a much lower key than the other games I've mentioned before, Spec Ops The Line breaks the fourth wall but in a much different way within context to the story. As you continue playing the game, it's pretty much telling you that you shouldn't have played it in the first place. Spec Ops The Line was marketed as a bang bang shooty shooty game where you kill all the evil bad guys and go home to respect your women afterwards. And the start of the game plays out like this, with the three main characters blitzing through Dubai like no one's business until you have to deploy some white phosphorus in an area, and you probably play through this level thinking nothing much will come from it, and it turns out that the people you brutally murdered were all innocent. We were helping. What? Oh no. The game wastes no time in blaming you for your actions, not Walker. You, the loading screen start directly talking to you instead of giving game tips, asking things like whether you feel like a hero yet, or just outright blaming you for going through the game. Spec Ops also contains a concept that I'll delve into a little later in the video characters being aware that they're in a game. During the helicopter chase sequence, Walker has a sense of realization that he's been in this situation before. Wait! Wait, this isn't right! It's And he's right, you have played the scene before. The loading screen also sometimes reassures you that you're in a game so there are no full life consequences. The whole point of the game is to make you feel bad that you even considered buying and playing it since at any point you could have stopped, but you didn't. You continued playing. It's probably why the game didn't sell as well if the whole shtick is to not play it. Throughout the 2000s and early 2010s, meta horror was used sparingly, but when it was, it was used effectively. There was one major limitation to this, however. These major games were released on a console, and lots of them were multi-platform games. You could be watching a cutscene, and the character in the cutscene turns to the the camera and tells you to turn off your PlayStation. 
Which is odd since you're playing this on a Nintendo DSi XL. As the years went by though, more and more games started to use this meta horror concept to further their narrative. And the growth of the PC gaming industry helped a lot, as now instead of breaking someone's console beyond repair and getting angry messages from Sony and Microsoft, you could break someone's PC and get away with it scot-free with no actual consequences. Unlike the 2000s where random acts of meta horror were rare, the 2010s took it and rinsed it through, with fourth wall breaking games designed to screw with you IRL popping up frequently. Marketplaces such as Itch.io, Game Jolt and Steam are arguably the greatest things to happen to this genre since YouTube, and these games started to pop up left, right and centre. Meta horror pretty much became its own genre with the advent of creepypastas, seeing as the intention of most creepypastas is to directly freak you out, and with .exe games starting to gain momentum, this was a perfect outlet for developers to disguise their trojans as a TalesDoll.exe executable file. You'd load the game up and then it shuts off all by itself. And takes your entire PC with it. And your secret PayPal wallet. Creepypasta games were the easiest way that meta horror could flourish, but I already made a video about them which you can watch at the top right corner of the screen. Since there are loads of examples of this and I don't want to keep all of you here forever, I'm going to go into detail about games throughout the 2010s that used meta to their advantage to further the gameplay and the storyline of their respective games. Starting with I'm Scared, a Pixelated Nightmare is a game created by Ivan Zanotti in October 2012. When you start the game, you're immediately greeted with a warning that tells you that the game will try to deceive you as many times as it can, telling you to check the folder outside the game files to report any error. After this ominous screen, you're put into a world that looks like it was made in the 400 ADs with Windows BC PCs. You could literally count the pixels on the screen as you played the game, probably why the game is called a pixelated nightmare to begin with. When you start the game, you're shrouded in darkness and you explore a dark, scary, creepy, freaky, terrifying, horrifying bedroom. Exploring the surrounding areas of the bedroom even more and you'll eventually find a room that looks and sounds like the insides of an uncooked turkey that's been frozen for three minutes too long. And you'll pick up a pulsating heart, which is all well and good until you turn around. It's after this point that the actual game would begin. Remember how I mentioned previously that the game warns you to check the files if a glitch occurs? Well, it turns out that one of the glitches in the game has become sentient and taken a life of its own, and it wants the player to continue playing the game. Throughout the rest of the game, you're now exploring a dark world with very creepy ambience and that face constantly staring at you as you make your way through the contents of the game. One of the mechanics of the game is that it constantly breaks the fourth wall in the best and worst way possible. Not only is the glitch aware that it's in the game, but as you continue playing, it makes countless efforts to freak you out or give you directions outside of the game, oh, such as constantly yeah. shutting down to open a Wait, new tab in your browser, is... linking to a YouTube video by the creator that gives you guidance on how to deal with the creepy things happening in the game. The game also relies on a lot of jump scares, which is a bit of a shame, seeing as the pixelated aesthetic of the game and the meta horror aspects of it were already creepy enough to start with. Sometimes it also gets a bit frustrating when the game either minimizes to a screen the size of a pea, or keeps restarting over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. But I'm Scared provided something new to the indie horror game community. It not only showed that there was a mass market for pixelated horror games, it arguably started a trend of games using this gimmick to either scare the player or move the narrative forward through meta horror or meta humor. The original version of this game released in 2012 was much shorter and only ended an eighth of the way through the full game which was released on January the 31st 2016. During my own playthrough of the game, one thing I despised about the game more than anything though was the fact that on the full release of the game you had to get every single achievement in the game in order to beat it. And yes I know there's only like 11 achievements, it's incredibly frustrating to have to start over again to get the achievements that I missed. But apart from that it was an effective meta horror game that did the job of scaring the player effectively. Upon release of the game, it was played by several YouTubers, and fans prayed for more games like I'm Scared and the 2010s delivered. In the same vein as I'm Scared, Undertale uses this concept, but does this on steroids. While I won't go into detail about every little thing it does, since I could probably make a full video about it, I'll just narrow things down to the genocide route. By now, everyone knows the genocide route. You've completed the game multiple times and want a new challenge. So just because you have the option to, you decide to go on a genocide run. Literally every major boss battle and antagonist in Undertale uses the fourth wall to cheese you out of a victory almost every single time fuck and sans is the absolute worst at this he realizes that it's not frisk that's the problem but it's you the player as soon as he's acquired the target he then proceeds to fuck 
you up using meta not as a way to scare you but to completely break your morale he uses your save files your menu screen literally everything against you in a disgustingly difficult boss fight that would make osu play a shed a tear if you eventually manage to get past sans you then get to the actual scary part of the game the first child, who tells you that you've pretty much reached the end because you've maxed out your potential. You're then given a choice to either become partners with her to help destroy the world, or not. You probably should choose the first option because choosing the latter option will do this. That is Meta Horror on crack. Another game that skirts the line between Meta and Meta Horror is One Shot. One Shot is a game released by Little Cat Fee on December 9th, 2016, and it follows a child called Nico, who is placed in a world without the sun. <laughs> Before you get your party poppers out, it's not THE sun, it's just a normal sun. Sorry guys. Anyway, like Undertale, this game is meta as fuck. Even though you're playing the game from the perspective of Nico in a top-down view, you as the player are a completely separate character in the game. This game used RPG Maker to its advantage and it contained many puzzles that the player needed to solve using concepts out of the game's window, such as looking through the files, changing your desktop background in some areas, and my favorite example, shaking the window off screen and back to simulate the development of film oh. to watch. F***ing mind blown! Throughout the duration of the game, you guide Nico through the dark world and meet various different entities in the universe while trying to escape from an entity called the Entity. Nico and the Entity both address you directly by name and the Entity tells you that you only have one shot to beat the game. Now in the original version, they were not joking when they said you had one shot and you needed to make it count because if you close the window, you'll never get this moment again. Because if you close the window and try to reopen the game, you're greeted with this. Because you closed the game, Nico couldn't find their way around and died as a result. The game tells you this when you try to close the window again and you can never play the game again. Spare a thought for the poor guys that played through most of the game only for the power in their house to cut or get a blue screen of death. <laughs> Not to worry though, because the game gives you another chance in the remake of the game in 2016. Now I didn't want to mention this specific fourth wall break as it's spoiler incarnate and I strongly suggest you play the game first, but it's too cool to not mention in this video, so direct spoilers ahead. At the end of the game, you're given two choices. To break the sun you've been carrying all game and return Nico home, or place the sun at the top of the tower, reigniting the world, but at the cost of Nico being trapped in this world. Choosing to break the sun will shroud the world in darkness, but not before Nico is finally freed and goes home by walking through your game window and out of the monitor screen and towards you on- Nah, I'm just kidding. He just walks right through the game window and away, ending the game. Mind blown. One Shot is an amazing game that uses metafictional techniques to further its storyline with horror and atmosphere at the same time, and is a near perfect example of games using the fourth wall to its advantage to further the narrative and the storyline of the game. In recent years, games have been using the concept that the main character is aware that they're in a game to scare or directly interact with the player, such as Monica from Doki Doki Literature Club. As the president of the literature club, she knows what the player is doing and tries to interact with the player at any given moment in time. Also messing with desktop files to further the narrative. I made a video detailing all of these events and more, and you can watch that on the top right corner of the screen. Moving away from the horror aspect of things, The Stanley Parable and The Beginner's Guide, both by the same developer, are both amazing meta games that use the fourth wall effectively to make for a fun and entertaining experience, with The Stanley Parable being chock full of fourth wall breaking moments and even having an achievement to not open the game for five whole years. With indie games being released left, right and center on PC, and more and more of them using the fourth wall to their advantage, Meta Horror has gone from a rare occasion in a video game where it's used as a quick scare to its own genre where developers are now basing their narrative entirely around the concept of pulling players into its magic circle and involving them in their own world. Who knows, in the future we could have Meta Horror in VR where the game rings your doorbell and gives you a package that you need to pick up and upgrade in the real world before continuing to play the game, moving one step closer to the world like in Ready Player One.
Thank you guys for watching this video. And before I get to the outro, I guess I have to address the big elephant in the room, which is my upload schedule. Obviously, you guys have noticed I haven't really uploaded all that regularly on my channel through February. And that was because I've been extremely busy with getting my second channel and my Twitch channel going, both of which are linked in the description, where you can watch clips from my streams or highlights on T9. A lot of the games that I play in my videos are normally streamed there, so you can watch highlights immediately after this video on my second channel. As well as this, you can watch the full archives of my streams on the third channel Thaf VODs, which will also be linked in the description. Unfortunately, with the coronavirus taking over the entire world, a lot of the conventions I was planning on going to have been cancelled. But this is all the more reasons for you guys to join my Discord server for fun and games and sometimes a quick chat with me, as well as frequent updates on my social media. While you're at it, why not pledge to my Patreon? You get early and exclusive access to future videos, access to my scripts as soon as I finish them, and extra perks on my Discord server. Thanks to Priant, Monty, Firm Elgar, Admiral Vape, Angie, Dakota Lewis, Bailey, Dag, Kilobyte, Solico, Derek, Uncle Bob 2004, and Plague for pledging to me with the Ascended Pledge. And a special thanks to Nighttide Draco for the $50 pledge on Patreon. Make sure to watch the video that's uploaded on my second channel, and I'll see you in another video.